Welcome to the third video in a playlist, Ethics and Artificial Intelligence Case Analysis. So here's where we are um, in the, uh, the chart. This sh should look familiar from other videos if you've been watching other videos. So we have these four moments of analysis, moments where we're breaking things down to pieces in order to examine them carefully, and only then will we put everything back together in a synthesis and make our final recommendation. Okay. So we talked a little bit about a contextual analysis. I didn't have much to say about it because uh, being good at a contextual analysis is just a matter of paying attention in life. Um, hopefully you've been, you know, <laughs> uh, are, are pretty good, pretty skilled at identifying uh, what's important about situations. What are the facts that are really creating the context? What are the, what are the systems and the situations that make this case interesting and important? Now, we're going to talk about a rationalization analysis. Okay, so uh, rationalizations, there's different ways to use that word. The way I'm using it here um, uh, are as moral excuses. So rationalizations and moral excuses are, will be synonyms here. So what's important about this moment is that we all have these moral compasses, okay? And they are usually pretty good. You know, we've been raised by good people. Um, we've, we've been in communities that care about us, that ha have you know, taught us what's right, the difference between right and wrong. And more often than not, people are pretty good about understanding right and wrong. Okay? So a lot of bad things that happen in this world don't happen because people are confused about right and wrong. They happen because they tell themselves a moral excuse that, in a sense, short, cir short circuits the ethical part of their brain and cuts it off and says, you know what, I, uh, I'm not going to worry about the ethics because of this other thing. Okay, So uh, that's what this analysis is about. The rationalization analysis is trying to think about those things that, that we tell ourselves to excuse ourselves from thinking about ethics. Um, I'm going to come back to this, this difficulty in a future video when we actually talk about the action analysis, but it's a, I think it's good to keep in mind now as we go through this that all of these rationalizations, there are certain situations where they make sense. So you can't just say, aha, here's a rationalization, therefore it's morally bad. Um, we have to go the further step and think, aha, here's a rationalization, and now we have to figure out, in this situation, does that rationalization make any sense, or is it functioning as a moral excuse? Okay, I'm just throwing that out there. Don't overthink that last point right now. Uh, the important thing now is just to march through the different rationalizations and, um, and get ourselves a list. But that problem is not going away. It's going to come back uh, later on. All right, so here's the list. I know this is a little busy, but I'm going to go through each of these uh, one by one. What I want you to see now is that the structure of these is similar. Okay? They all are different ways to finish the same sentence beginning. Okay? The sentence is, this seems unethical, comma, but... All right? This seems unethical, but... Right? So I'm trying to describe that moment that, that we're all familiar with, where you just have this little, like, hmm, ooh, is that okay? Like, that makes me uncomfortable. Like, I don't think that's good. Like, that's, there's something wrong here. There's something unjust. That, like, I'm not sure about this, okay? So, so, that's what I mean by this seems unethical. We all have those moments where you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem completely okay. There's something wrong with that. Comma, but, <laughs> so, uh, th that conjunction, like, you go in a different direction, right? This seems unethical, but I'm not going to worry about that, that bothersome seeming unethical because there's some excuse that I'm giving. And what we have here are a list of nine different ways to finish that sentence. That is to say, nine different excuses that we can give ourselves. Okay, let me go through each of these one by one. The first one is obedience. This seems unethical. The sentence always starts the same way. This seems unethical, but I'm just following orders. I'm just doing my job. This is uh, a really powerful one. I mean, they're all powerful, but there's two or three that, that, are, that really show up all the time for human beings. And this is one. Um, so uh, you can, on YouTube, just uh, uh, search for this. This video will show up. 
Um, the heist is some kind of show that recreated an old experiment called the Milgram experiment. Um, but the way the heist did it, I mean, you know, there was uh, better editing and stuff like that. And also, the way they ran the experiment was basically the same, and the results they got were basically the same. So I don't want to say too much, because I want you to watch this 10-minute video. It's, it's um, kind of shocking, actually. <laughs> but the point I want you to take away, you can watch the characters in the story. Most of them are willing to do very, very unethical things because someone who seems like they know what they're talking about is telling them to do those unethical things. And they're like, well, I guess I'll do it because he said to, and he looks like he has a lab coat on, so doesn't that mean he knows what he's talking about? It's, it's, it's kind of shocking. Um, so that is a big rationalization, the rationalization of obedience. And again, uh, I'm not going to say this, repeat this every time, but this is a good time to remind ourselves that obedience, I'm not saying obedience is a bad thing, right? All of these rationalizations do actually make sense. There is a time where obedience is the right thing to do. Like, I wasn't sure about this situation, but I was following orders, and that can be a valid thing to say. It's just that it's not always a valid thing to say. It's just that sometimes it actually blocks us from using our own values to think through our own life situations. And when it does that, when it stops the ethical part of our brain from working, that's when it gets scary. But again, nothing wrong with obedience. And, and it's going to be the same with all the others that I'll go through. Conformity. This seems unethical, but everyone does it. It's just... It's a normal practice, it's standard, it's just what people expect. Um, again, I've, uh, th there's a YouTube video, just search for this. Um, it's a much older video, it's, it's shorter too. It's, it's, it's kind of funny actually, more funny than scary. Um, it, but the, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiment where, where you can see people in real time um, abandon what what they think really makes sense just because they're trying to like fit in with everybody just because they don't want to rock the boat just because they don't want to like be the one who's doing things different it's like i could say what the right answer is but oh it's just going to be easier to fit in um so in a moral sense uh that can be really important and a very powerful distraction from doing what's right futility okay uh, the sentence starts the same way as always. This seems unethical. And then you finish the sentence this way. You say, but if I quit, or I refuse to do it, or if I say, hey boss, I'm out of here, you, you can't get me to do this, I'm just going to quit. Well, what would happen then? Um, I would be unemployed, and they're just going to hire somebody else who will do it, like a yes man, right? So I might as well stay in the job and do this thing that makes me uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable ethically speaking, because you know it's better me than just some yes man who has no morals at all. At least I have morals, and at least I can like kind of, kind of uh, keep things under control. Uh, again, there are situations where that actually makes sense and is the right thing to do, but. Uh, it can also be a way to shut down our own moral reflection. And if you do that, then I would say you're using the moral excuse of futility. Hurry. This seems unethical, but I must make an immediate decision. Um, there's no uh, videos about it, or at least none that I found on YouTube. But there's this really interesting, well-known experiment from a few decades ago uh, where there were these people who were training to be pastors. This is at a seminary. Okay, so, you know, these these people are, you know, like, <laughs> apparently pretty good people. Uh, and they uh, had, they were, they were told to prepare a lesson on the Good Samaritan. Okay, so if you know the story of the Good Samaritan, it's about some, uh, it's about a person who stopped, uh, an unlikely person who stopped and helped someone else who was beaten and bruised on the side of the road and saved his life. Okay. Uh, so they divided these, these pastors who had prepared the sermon into two groups. And um, they told the two groups different things. They said to the one group, oh, uh, you're late to deliver your sermon. You, you need to get over to the chapel in like five minutes in order to deliver your sermon. The other group, uh, they told them, oh, you have plenty of time. You have like hours before you have to actually give your sermon. So uh, no problem. Well, what happened is in between where they were in the chapel, 
uh, there was an actor in the experiment who was acting like he was beaten and bruised on the side of the road. <laughs> Where have you heard this before? Oh yeah, the sermon I was just working on like five minutes ago, okay? Well, it turns out that the, the group of people who thought they were in a big hurry, a very, very low percentage stopped to help because they were in a hurry. It was just like, ooh, ooh sorry, buddy. I hope somebody takes care of that, but I've got to get over for my important thing that someone else told me I got, I got to do. The good news is the group that wasn't on a tight timeline, the group said, yo, you have hours, just get over to the chapel at some point. Most of them, almost all of them, stopped and were like, oh my gosh, this is a person that needs help. Let's figure out how to help them. So it turns out that, that hurry can be seen as a moral excuse, right? Hurry shuts down the ethical part of our brain. If we think we're in a hurry, uh, we might not make as good of a decision, ethically speaking. Ends justify the means. This is another really huge one um, because with ends justify the means, you can literally justify anything you want. Um, that's, that's what makes it so scary. Okay, so ends justify the means. The ends are like the goal, like your final goal that you want. The means are the how you get there. Okay, this seems unethical, but in the long term or in the big picture, most people are going to be better off, right? So the means are, it seems unethical, it seems the, the means are bad, but the end is so good that it justifies the means. So that's scary because like you could say that about any situation. I mean, pick the most the most messed up, horrible, unethical situations you can think of from world history. I guarantee you there was somebody among the the top decision makers that went through this thought process. They thought something like, well, this genocide is going to be bad because it's going to kill so many innocent people. But in the long run, people are, overall are going to be better off. Civilization is going to be better off. So that, that's what makes this so scary, because it's pretty easy to put this moral excuse into really anything. Fixation. Um, I think of fixation as, as the cousin of ends justify the means. It is very similar to ends justify the means, but not exactly the same thing. Um, fixation says, this seems unethical, but I have an important goal to achieve. Okay, so the... The difference is this. In ends justify the means, you are wide-eyed about the, the unethical nature of the means. right? You understand that you're going to have to do some bad things to get the thing that you want. In fixation, you're kind of like putting on blinders, maybe subconsciously, uh, maybe consciously too, but like you, you're not paying attention, you're not thinking about the means. You're just thinking about Here's what I have to do, and whatever I have to do to get that goal, that's what I'm going to do. Um, this one, uh, you know, after years of teaching business ethics, I, I kind of put this one in, in addition to ends justify the means, because a lot of businesses do this with profit, right? Profit is a, a goal that they have, and they just don't think about all the harms that they're creating along the way, because... I, I have an important goal. I have to make as much profit for the shareholders as possible, as long as I don't break the law. So this actually makes a lot of sense of many business situations. But uh, in other contexts too, AI here, obviously is what we care about. Um, we're just going to leave it on the list because I think it's a nice addition, a nice complement to and justify the means in general. Materiality. Uh, I, I'm using the word materiality here, and um, I got this and a couple of these others um, from a, a book called Giving Voice to Values, and I, then I added a few of my own. Um, but this one came from Giving Voice to Values. Uh, materiality is, I'm obviously there's lots of ways to use the word materiality. I'm using it the way the, the lawyers use it, um, where if something's material, that means it has a big effect or impact. If something's immaterial, that means it doesn't have much of an effect or impact. So materiality is saying this seems unethical, but it's not really hurting anyone. It's like a victimless crime, or uh, it's not going to really change anybody's life in a significant way. Um, so what? Okay, so that's one way to excuse ourselves from having to think about values, right? Putting, putting this excuse of it's not that big of a deal, it's not really hurting anybody anyway. Maybe it's wrong, but it's not really affecting anybody. 
Loyalty. Uh, loyalty is another one, maybe like obedience, that you might have thought like surprised you to see on the list because you know we usually think of loyalty as a positive thing, right? You want to be a loyal person. That's a virtue, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and uh, there are many situations where loyalty is a really good reason to do something or not do something. But what I'm saying is that it can also cover up a lot of unethical behavior. Because what you do is you can say, well, this seems bad, but I don't want to be disloyal to my, right? If, if I don't do this unethical thing that my boss is asking me to do, um, then my, you know, I won't have money for my family. So out of loyalty for them, I have to like do this bad thing. Uh, and you can do that with anybody, like anybody that you, you say you want to be loyal to. Like, I don't want to falsify these numbers, but if I don't, then my entire team is not going to get their bonus. And that wouldn't be fair to them. So out of loyalty for my team, I've got to do this unethical thing. So loyalty, uh, is it a virtue in general? Sure, yes, absolutely. We want loyalty. Loyalty in this world is good. But it can also function as a moral excuse that covers up a lot of, a lot of bad behavior. Relativism, see how confused this guy is? This seems unethical, but who am I to say what's right here? Um, this is you know, uh, one that, in the abstract, I think people connect with a lot. This idea of like, hey, everybody's got their own thing. Everybody, every culture's got their own way to deal with things. Um, in the real world, it doesn't quite show up as much, but I think it still belongs in the list. It still is a moral excuse, right? When you, when you say, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it that way. Like, that seems bad to me, but, like, uh, you know, they've got their own standards. I've got my own standards. You know, who, who are we? Who am I to say? All right. So, as promised, uh, we marched through our list of nine, and we have nine moral excuses. So, when we get to actual cases uh, where we're, we do it, where we do a case analysis, it might be helpful to ha just have this list pulled up. All right, and uh, so now we've got contextual analysis, rationalization analysis, now you know what that is. Value analysis, there was a previous video where I just went over that because there's another playlist that actually covered that because it's such a deep one. So we've just got one more stage of analysis to go, the action analysis, and then we'll be in a position to think about Final recommendation.